Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whichever part of uh, the world you're in at the moment. Personally, I'm in Greece, Rhodos Island, so I'll say a good evening to everybody. We would like to thank uh, Dr. George Simons for his presentation today. We're looking forward to it, bringing people together, the power of interaction. Barry, I'll hand it over to you so you can uh, present Dr. George Simons, and we are all ears at the moment. Well, Karistopoli, Mikael. Yes, Kalispera. Kalispera says. So, Michael, thank you so much for that. Um, gosh, where do we start? George and I have known each other for quite a long time um, around, uh, around Europe. Uh, he currently lives in France and um, this is the moment, I think, in the uh, south of France, uh, on the borders anyway. So I hope the weather's great. Um, mainly, the main contact we've had is that George is considered one of the founders of intercultural communication, teaching and learning. And he was on the governing board of CETA. Should I say CETA is the uh, major... Um, um, teacher training body uh, associated with intercultural communication and, um, and uh, Society for International Education Training and Research is its official name. He's also a writer, a very prolific writer, and you can find the, um, his writings actually listed in the biography that accompanies the uh, um, advert, as it were, for this. And which I wasn't really, and I'm still not into, so I'm looking forward to learning about it, is the inventor of diversity. And that was picked up on by Silke Riegler, who gave our um, webinar in uh, January, and who was here this afternoon. And um, basically, what I wanted to do was find out about diversity, and I asked George if he'd tell us, and he has kindly agreed to do so. He's worked in over 60 countries, speaks four languages fluently, has worked for BNP Paribas, which is the French National Bank and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, and is really a key figure, both in language learning and also in um, this process of using gaming to create interaction in the classroom and uh, online. So, George, with that, over to you as the master. Thank you very much, Barry, uh, for all the kind words. Um... Just It just means I'm getting older. I've done a lot of stuff <laughs> as time has gone on. At any rate, what I want to do to you today, do to you, not do, do with you today, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> I want to bring some things together. I recently wrote a paper called Culture Ain't What It Used To Be. And what's happened is that linguistics and what we see as neuroscience is telling us a lot about how we operate as human beings. And it's telling us we need to reevaluate how we think of teaching and learning around culture. So I'm going to try and give you some of that sort of stuff from the linguistic and uh, uh, the point of view of gamification and how we can put learning into games to pay attention. I mean, I, I have a teenager in my neighborhood who says, I don't want to go to school anymore. Why should I sit there and listen to somebody go blah, 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 when I can find out anything I want to know right on my phone, my iPhone, okay? So we're into a new world here. And uh, what I want to do is start out with the idea of the linguistic end of it. What's in a word? You know, how, how are cultural narratives hidden in the language we learn? So I'm going to give you a task to start out with. Um, uh, everybody gets a name. Sometimes it's made, decided on before you're born, sometimes afterwards. My name's George. Uh, uh, as Michael knows, that means farmer in Greek. I had an infern recently whose name was Heidi, and uh, her mother was reading that wonderful little Swiss novel before she was born, while she was pregnant. And uh, the next name there is the most popular name in the world. What is it? Man's name. Quick, somebody say. That's right, it's Mohammed. And, you know, people have names that are of, after famous characters like Attila. Um, in the south of the United States, women are called Missy and guys are called Bubba sometimes. Um, and Gwyn is a, is a um, name of uh, interesting 
uh, background for uh, people from Vietnam. Uh, I have a colleague whose name is Quajo, which means Monday. That's the day on which he was born. And that's the first name you get in his tribe. Uh, people in in the uh, hippie movement a few years ago uh, named kids after plants and animals and Heather and black people in the United States didn't have last names. So they picked the last names of presidents like Washington and Adams and so on. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to just think for 30 seconds about what is the peculiarity of your name? For example, I know George means George. Uh, I'm a phony because my original name was Simonovich, but my grandfather and father as immigrants to uh, the United States, which has always been very welcoming to people who aren't their kind, uh, were tired of being called Simonovich, the son of a bitch. So they changed their name to Simons and my name too. So what's in your name? Just think for about 30 seconds. And if anybody wants to put a comment in the chat, they can. Um, think about that. What's in your name? Hmm? How has your name shaped your life and your culture? Did you like your name? Did you want to change your name? Was something bad made out of your name at some point at school? Okay, I just put that in there so everybody knows that you have a story before you're even born, if they've decided on your name by that time. And um, uh, that starts the cycle of things, the cycle of discourse that creates the culture that's inside of you. Now, you know, if we could turn up the volume, what would we hear? We're talking to ourselves all the time, sometimes uh, just endlessly, even in our dreams. Huh? So if we could turn up the volume, what would we hear is the question. I don't want you to do that right now, but think of the fact that, you know, we, we speak eight times as fast to ourselves if we're articulating it in words uh, to each other. And talking to ourselves, believe it or not, is called listening. We're trying to figure out what's going on. What's this? What's happening? What should we do about it if we should do anything about it? So culture is constantly speaking to us. What we have back there is making its way to the front to help us interpret what's going on, okay? In English, we say, this is such a noisy place, I can't hear myself think. Well, that's not true because actually what we're listening about the disturbance is I can't hear myself think. So we're actually hearing ourselves think quite well. And we're always doing that. And what that has left us with is all kinds of things that are coming up automatically uh, and giving us a sense of who we are, what we are, what's our identity. And, you know, I've got a whole list of the kinds of names that we put on things here. By the way, we're going to give you the slides when we're all done with this, as I'm sort of rushing through it, um, as there's a lot to say about it. But at any rate, you're always interacting with your culture, with the stories that you've inherited, with the stories that have come down to you. And what we know now from neuroscience is that... You know, we used to think of ourselves for, at least in the West, for a couple thousand years as sort of a divided being. There was mind, that wonderful thing over matter, the body, huh? soul and body and all that other sort of stuff. The ghost in the machine was one way of talking about human nature. And what we're learning from neuroscience is our, our consciousness, our science, our, our neurological network is part of our whole lives right down from the top of our top of our head to the tip of our toes and actually you know i think we've we've had some instinctual understanding of this sort of thing because you can look at some of the phrases i put the ones we have in here in english and i know there are other languages which have things about how our body is involved in how we think so i say i know in my heart my gut tells me okay he or she is a pain in the neck or maybe some other anatomical location where the pain is, is indicated. <laughs> but at any rate, I say it's on the tip of my tongue. I'm not sure how to handle what you say. I'm tongue-tied. It's my knee-jerk reaction. So your culture, your language may use different body parts and expressions for how we think and feel, 
And by the way, thinking and feeling are, are integral to each other. So it's, it's not a matter of our uh, creating something uh, separate. So first of all, this is one of the great discoveries of neuroscience is that we are totally and thoroughly ourselves and our culture from the top to the bottom. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing a, a cultural lecture, I say, what is culture? And I show them a T-bone steak, you know, on a slide. And I say, well, maybe not that's the exact cut. And then I show them the neurological system. And I say, yes, culture is the, is the ongoing flow and process of all of these things, all of the discourse that has come to us, that we're creating, that we share with each other, and we pick you know, up from each And then there's this description by um, Lewis and McFarquhar uh, about the fact that thinking takes place simultaneously along millions of different pathways. Uh, this is in our body. And uh, when we encounter something new, the brain activates this pattern so that the new thing, uh, what the new things closely remembers is telling us what we probably should want to do about it, whether it's a threatening predator or a philosophical concept. And um, so, you know, uh, Wittgenstein was very good at, at talking about this sort of thing. Language is a part of our organism and it's no less complicated than it. So, you know, in the limits of my language are the limits of my world and uttering, uttering a word is like striking a note on the keyboard of imagination. That's uh, what uh, Ludwig is telling us very, very clearly here. Um, and so, you know, when does culture start talking to us? I already mentioned about your names, uh, your genes, your neural patterns, mama's habit, birth trauma, nutrition, all of these things feed into the story of who we are and where we're going. So if I were to give a definition, which I think is really contemporary uh, for um, uh, culture in this age of neuroscience. Um, well, um, I'm taking this from a children's book, which is called Crow and Weasel. And you see the two characters over there, the crow and the weasel. And um, what you've got here is this description. The stories people tell have a way of taking care of them. If stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them away where they are needed. Sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive. That's why we put these stories in each other's memory. This is how people care for themselves. So what we're saying is that culture is how we care for ourselves in the environment in which we find ourselves, okay? And in the circumstances that come. As Isaac Dennison says, to be a person is to have a story to tell. Uh, this is a lovely woman that I fell in love with and I've got her picture on my wall overlooking my work every day. Her name is Laura and she's made up of stories. Um, there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful artist who created Laura. And if you, you can see a little bit in the slide, but if you came to my living room, you could look at Laura is made up of all kinds of images from her Facebook, from her stories, from her, from her accounts and so on. And it makes her portrait. And I thought it's the most wonderful thing I've seen to talk about how we are made up of the cultural stories that feed into our identity and uh, take us into the future. So before you get jealous at my having such a lovely young woman at age 85 um, in, in my life, um, realize we're all made up of beautiful stories and uh, that's our portrait, that's our identity. Uh, this is Sergio Albiac, the artist who did this and I wanted to give credit to him by putting his face in, in one of his own uh, creations for you to see it. I, I, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with Napoleon. Uh, this is in, in Bratislava in the town square. And I was sitting next to him and I, Napoleon said to me, history is a series of lies that we all agree on. And uh, my comment is we live in the world shaped by the stories we tell about who we are. And this is coming right to the forefront now in our studies about culture. Namely, that our identity is the critical item that is in our decision-making process and in our living process. 
And in, in intercultural work, we, we see the creativity of this. Uh, in the beginning was the word. Huh? This is a biblical statement. Yehi um, or, let there be light, okay? Um, it's uh, in, in the one Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition, we have a God who speaks things into reality. And actually, uh, as it says in one of the other biblical passages, you are gods because you are speaking things into reality. And uh, are they lies? Well, they can be. But on the other hand, they're, they're our way of seeing what's going on and what we need to do about it and how we want to care for each other. And yet what we know is that the collective memory is systemically unfaithful to the past in order to satisfy the needs of the present. In other words, we attempt to address the present by reconstructing the past as if it always existed in the way we now adapt it. And what is this? This is called, um, you know, this is called meta narratives, the big stories. A French uh, sociologist, Lyotard, uh, uh, coined this word about the uh, meta narratives, things like the economic system that we have, you know, of the nation state. Sure, money is imaginary, but at least it's got everybody imagining it. Hmm? So in other words, we are creating our culture and our world, but as one of the most recent authors in the cultural field stated, we need to be very careful. Culture is not a solid, it's a liquid, it's a process. It's an ongoing process inside of us. And so, you know, when we look in the mirror and we like ourselves or we don't like ourselves, the Images in the mirror may be distorted by socially constructed ideas of what we think is beautiful or handsome. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these ideas come from all over the place. They come from me, from you, from everybody, from somebody, nobody, mother, the mosque, uh, the church, the magazines, the market, and so on. So this is how culture is being created in the ongoing discourse in which we live. And uh, so it's, it's our world is held together, but of course, as, as as different cultures encounter each other, we have the challenge of how do we both communicate and how do we synergize and how do we, how do we take advantage of the, the depth and the, and the wisdom and riches of each other's cultures. Too much of intercultural work, as I've seen it over the years, has been about how do I avoid make mistakes? You know, uh, an early book, which is very good, was about kiss, bow, or shake hands. Hmm? So, it's all about how do we recognize and how do we accomplish it and how do we learn about each other's stories, okay? So constructing the identity discourse uh, is very interesting because you may think that you have good reasons for making a certain decision, but what really happens is the decision is made by the corresponding relevance to your identity and then you create the decisions afterwards the funny little story here that the, and then the mean old kitty ah, stole all the doggy treats and ran down the street and that's why we chase cats until this day we have stories for everything and most of our reasons are just stories that we have created to support uh, uh the identity that we bear so are we trapped by the worlds we create hmm? by the floodwaters as discourse rages? Who are you and I when someone declares a we? Huh? We talk about us versus them. Right now I'm engaged in a, in a very, very interesting process of creating a game on um, uh, decolonization. And my colleague is working one on, well, with one on populism, which is all about how do we create the us versus the we so we can get rid of the we who are not very much like us. <laughs> um, so how do we step out of this? How do we rest? How do we, how do we, how do we prevent getting torn up by the torrents that look like they're gonna drown us? How, how do we master our inner ecology, you know, and uh, make our way to the sea? One of the things we decided was that if stories are what make us up, sharing our stories is the best way for us to connect with each other. In other words, how do we share our stories? So there's lots of ways of doing that. But what I've specialized in, as Barry said in the outset, is a, a gamification. 
we have a game called Diversify. And it's a game that started out as a board game and then as a card game, and now it's online. Uh, and we're going to play a little bit of it with you uh, in a couple of seconds here. Because what happens is that this, this kind of game helps you show, share your stories with people That's from all over the world who are different <laughs> from you. Somebody wants to show or sh share their story. They're real bad, huh? Who's that kid? <laughs> Somebody. Okay. Anyway, we've done these all over the world, as you see from the image here. And the cards, the, the game consists, it's going to be in PowerPoint for you, but the game consists of five different kinds of cards. There's what we call choice cards. How should I behave in a certain situation in a certain culture? Or how should I think about it? Uh, there are guide cards. What are the insights uh, that insightful people have had about culture? Uh, how, risk cards. How do I react to events that are unfamiliar to me? What happens to me? Sometimes I'm, I'm given uh, events that are real scary in my life, and sometimes I'm given wonderful events that I don't know what to do with. I had a visit uh, um, from a family, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the people who's going to be a facilitator with you, Assam's family came to me, and they overwhelmed me with gifts. I, you know, it's, I, I'm used to people bringing a bottle of vodka or a, a box of chocolates from time to time, but they just brought me wonderful things. And I didn't know, you know, how do I, this is a culture I was unfamiliar with. And um, there's just all kinds of things that come. There's share cards. We look at how does one culture, how does your culture do this? And then I try to tell you how my culture does this. And we see what's, what's involved in both of those things. And then factual knowledge is also important. Uh, smarts, what do I know? What do I know? These five kinds of things. So you're going to play a, a game in which there are five kinds of cards. And uh, they will be, uh, you have a chance to share it in your small group. Now, um, just a little aside here. Well, a lot of the recent games we made had to do with helping immigrants become acculturated in the new environments that they found themselves in. So what we, what we were looking at here is, is uh, what kinds of, I mean, just recently with the Ukraine crisis, we translated our Ukrainian game into 13 languages and translated other games into Ukrainian. So the people who were, who were asylum seekers or refugees from the, the present crisis there could be more quickly acculturated and feel at home. And uh, uh, the people who received them would be more familiar with them. And what we discovered in this is that we were doing multilingual games. And all of a sudden, those of you who may be language teachers realize you can't teach language without culture. And it's hard to teach culture without understanding that language has its differences. So, okay. Uh, so what we're looking at here is this one's in English and in Finnish and in Arabic which was uh, one that we created back when the, there were lots of uh, Arabic speaking uh, refugees coming from the Middle East. Okay, oh, we're ready to go to our breakout rooms and play this game. So what I'm gonna do is, um, we're, you're gonna be put into breakout rooms, but let me show you the, um, um, the cards we're going to use so these are the folks who are online, uh, at least uh, most of them are, who are going to be your facilitators. And um, uh, Jana, show the next slide, please. And that's the rest of us. I'm going to stay in the main room with whoever is left. Um, you're going to see, here's the rules, okay? And it's very simple. The facilitator will show you a card, pick somebody in the group, and will take turns responding to the card and discussing it. Please don't feel like you have to finish the whole game. Discuss it as well as you can, as, as uh, fully as you can. Tell your stories, share them with each other, and uh, just follow the instructions on the card. As I mentioned, the five kinds of cards are about facts, how to behave, what you're going to do in situation, uh, what's some wisdom about this, how do you do it if people in another culture do it in a different way. Let's, let's put it into the... Um, uh let's put it put people into the breakout rooms welcome back everybody uh i think it was an exciting experience i think um uh what do we feel george is the best thing is there any final remarks you want to make 
or do you feel that we should go straight on to the final announcements? I'd like, what I'd like to say is we're happy to share this, this portion of this selected game with anybody who wants to use it and try it. And uh, you can see more information about the kinds of games. And we're always interested in constructing new games. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're teachers and you have students who want to create a game, we have about, I think about 15 games now that have been created as student projects and they're just excellent. The two newest ones are on um, decolonization and populism. So we're getting into important social issues as well as uh, the, the uh, important uh, issues in culture. So uh, close it up, Barry. Thank you all for listening. Everybody be well. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank Fantastic you. presentation. Really great. And I think it was great to play the game. So thank you very much to all your colleagues who allowed us to participate and did so so successfully. Thank okay, you. quick announcement then before we go. You'll never have guessed this, but there is something in the world at the moment called Chat GB <laughs> GPT. Um, and uh, we have actually a, an expert on Chat GB <laughs> GPT, uh, general practice training, uh, Nick Peachy, who um, runs his own uh, publishing organization for teachers and uh, online. And he'll be actually presenting, and he has already done a seminar on this. Uh, which you can join up to uh, on how this is going to affect language classrooms and how we're all going to respond. So, George, watch this. You never know. You might have another game there. <laughs> OK, so that's that. Um, now, the next thing, of course, is um, we'll be summarizing George's presentation and previous presentations this year uh, in our ICC journal, which will be coming out um, at the end of the month. And uh, it's, if you want to sign up for it or even write for it, we're always very happy to hear from you. So we'll be looking forward to that and uh, just send us your details. And what we'll do is sign you up and you get it free of charge online three times a year. OK, and we're hoping, as Miriam pointed out, to try and get it to four years, four times a year. Now, this is most important, our ICCU Rolter. Right. Um, and Miriam, was... over to you. Right, pass the good word round. Uh, we'll be starting a new Euralta course after the summer months. We'll be starting on the 25th of October, and it's going to be an intensive one because the eight modules will run till February. So please tell all your colleagues that we're starting a new, a new course for language teaching to adults Euralta. I think by now everybody knows, should know what Euralta is about. Thank you. Great. And uh, Silke, thank you very much for your point. If you want to find out more about diversity right now, it's so easy, www.diversity.com. Okay, so write that one down and you've got it there for use. Good, okay. Um, uh, obviously we are keen to have teachers joining the ICC and schools joining the ICC. So if you are interested, do get in touch with us and we'll be delighted to help you where we can. Now, I think that's it. There's one more slide to go, but I think it's now time to say thank you very much and return you to Michael to close the session down. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much all for following us today. Thank you very much, Dr. George Simons. Very, very interesting, great games, nice rooms that we attended today. Barry, thank you also. Miriam, thank you for the information about the Uralta course starting in October. Hope to see you all during at our next webinar in approximately, let's say, three weeks, yep. three to four weeks' time. Yep. Just before the summer holidays really get into operation. That's right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Greece. <laughs> Goodbye to all. Goodbye. Yasu. <laughs>